modality of Leibniz. This is where he kind of gives a general view and a general view of his philosophy. And uh, what we'll see here is that it's kind of an extension of, of Descartes' thought experiment of the, the dreaming or the malicious demon. You know, that's my preferred way of thinking about the thought experiment of, of Descartes because it fits into the matrix. And then, and then the matrix, as it actually turns out, that film, the matrix, as it actually turns out, is very heavily influenced by Leibniz. Um, so there's, there's aspects of the matrix narrative that are really, really go beyond what Descartes is talking about. But we saw how it fits nicely. But then the overall construction of the matrix narrative is very indebted to Leibniz. So in, in the monadology, Leibniz describes how his whole metaphysical system works. And he says, you know, even a cannonball has, um, has little souls, multiple souls in it. And he even wants to go so far to say that within a cannonball, there's an infinite number of souls. And, and, and his argument for this is the following. It, you know, he says that every, he, he argues, you know, for these physical reasons in his discourse on metaphysics, he thinks he's discovered this. Um, now, Newton has a way of explaining it away in empirical terms, okay, but Leibniz believes that he has discovered that there has to be a soul in the cannonball. The cannonball has to have a soul because there's this force acting that can't be accounted for by the mathematics. Okay, but, but then what Newton does is he makes the mathematics work um, by defining force as mass times acceleration. But, so Leibniz starts from the premise, the, uh, the assumption, which he thinks he has proved, but let's assume with him that there is a soul in the cannonball that accounts for its actual motion, which can't be accounted for any other way. Well, you could split the cannonball in half, right? And maybe I should stop sharing the screen. So we have the cannonball. You could split the cannonball in half. And then you have half a cannonball. And you could split that in half. And then you have a quarter of a cannonball. And you can split that in half. And then you have an eighth of a cannonball. And you split that in half, you have a 16th, and a 32nd, and a 64th, and a 128th, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can do this, he believes, infinitely. That if you get pre precise enough instruments, you could keep dividing the cannonball into ever more smaller pieces. And especially in his day, there was no argument uh, against that. That seemed uh, potentially true. Um, <clears throat> and I think even in our day, it's not entirely clear that that isn't true. Uh, at a certain level, things go beyond uh, common sense explanations, and it isn't clear that, phys that physicists are, are able to deny this. I mean, I think they would deny it, but can they successfully prove it uh, coming back to this common sense sort of uh, example of a cannonball. Now, for a long time after Newton, and especially with uh, certain theories about the way that gases worked, people believed that there were atoms. And ultimately, you would get down to an atom of the catom of, of lead. You get to an atom of lead, and then that could not be divided. 
right? That's what people believe. But of course, contemporary physics uh, uh, for us today, you know, we're splitting atoms all the time. But is what, what do you mean by atoms? Are there actually smaller subatomic particles that are indivisible? Uh, you know, I don't think, at least at the level at which we are operating at, at Cerritos College, we're, we can't answer that question. Okay. Um, so the idea of infinite divisibility of the cannonball very much flies in the day of Leibniz and maybe still kind of flies today. So let's not, let's not uh, discount this. And, and on top of that, remember that I mentioned Galileo Galilei, uh, Galileo was grinding his own lenses to create, to, to construct his own telescopes so that he could personally make observations of the moons of Mars and things like that. Uh, that was new technology, so much so that Galileo is making his own telescopes. So at the beginning of this century, um, of the 17th century, Galileo is making his own telescopes because it's such new technology. And the same goes for uh, microscopes. It's the same, you know, a microscope and a telescope are very similar, right? And they work on the same fundamental technology. So microscopes are new. And you have people like um, Hook, I think his name's Robert Hook, who, uh, who's using microscopes to describe the, the cell structure of plants and, and animals and, and looking at these, these uh, deep structures, even uh, subcellular structures and, and describing these things. And if we think about, you know, our understanding of biology, uh, like in a, uh, a human person, let's take a, a, a skin cell, and, and you may have done this actually in high school where you take some skin cells off the inside of your, your cheek, and then you put them under a microscope and you can see in these cells, you can see that they are distinct objects. So the cells are distinct objects. And so Leibniz would say, well, that cell has a soul because it's gonna behave physically just like the cannonball and have that same problem of unexplainable force, which has to come from the soul of the cell. But then you look inside of the cell and you see that there are distinct components within the cell and those distinct components in the cell even look kind of like animals. They kind of even behave like animals. And, and so they have souls, not only for physical reasons, but also because they seem to be like animals. They have to have a soul. They're all wandering around and doing special tasks and uh, seem to be, seem to have a mind of their own. Uh, in a way like, not just like the way the cannonball can't be explained totally mathematically, but the way that like a dog seems to have a mind of its own. And uh, this all reinforces his idea that all these little substructures, each substructure, each thing that you can break off as a separate unit has a soul. So let's think about the mitochondria within, within a cell. Mitochondria, you know, especially in a common sense sort of way, they look like little animals wandering around in there. And that has a soul, but then the whole cell in which it exists has a soul. Even if just minimally in the way that a cannonball has a soul. Uh, but then that cell is incorporated into the skin structure of your cheek and your, and your skin in general, which is a distinct sort of organ within your body. And you could do it for like a heart cell or something like that. So it's more, maybe a nicer analogy. Um, 
Uh, but then the skin operates kind of on its own. And, and you know, your skin, if you, if you, you know, get a cut on your cheek, it then heals and seems to want to stay in this form. It has an entelechy where if you scratch your cheek, it's going to get deformed, but then it, it works somehow of its own volition in Leibniz's way of thinking to get back into the form that it has programmed into it. It has an entelechy in this Aristotelian sense. And the skin is obviously part of your body and the body is a distinct unit and obviously has a soul, all right? So this is in, undisputed in, in Leibniz's day. People believe that people have souls, uh, which I think most people, especially if we start to really unpack it, most people even today believe that people have souls in some way, in this Aristotelian way or something, maybe in not some religious way, but, but some philosophical way if they really start thinking about it. Uh, a lot of people, you know, a good chunk, may probably the majority of people, at least 51%, are thinking that we still have souls today. So, the, and, and, and in Leibniz's days, that just wasn't, everybody believed this, especially philosophers. And so, um, so what we get is a hierarchical structure. Hierarchical. So we get a hierarchy of substances. So like the, the, the cell out of the inside of my cheek is a substance. It has a material cause and it has a formal cause. And it's a distinct unit of reality. It's a substance. And it has substances, distinct units within it. And, and for liveness, that goes all the way down. There's an infinite number of smaller structures within anything. This is what he assumed. Because of the infinite divisibility of the cannonball or of anything. And but the mitochondria that are wandering around inside of a cell are controlled and dominated by those souls are controlled and dominated by the soul of the cell. And that, that soul of that cell is controlled and dominated by the skin. And the skin is controlled and dominated by the soul of my entire body. body. And then even further, he wants to say that uh, my soul trolled and dominated by as the soul of the universe. And so everything's in this hierarchical structure going infinitely down into substructures. And I don't think, now I don't, something that might arise in our mind, which did for me just now is, is he, is he justifying domination of one human being uh, in relationship to another? Not, uh, not entirely in a naturalistic way, in the way that the mitochondria within a cell are obviously dominated by the, by the soul of the cell. And the soul of the cell is obviously dominated by the soul of the skin. And the soul of the skin is obviously dominated by the soul of my body because those have this, this physical representation that is very clear. But if you have like a monarch, let's say the king, the king does dominate other human souls in a monarchy. And even within a republic, as we've discussed, the executive, the prime minister of the parliament, uh, for example, dominates 
the parliament and the parliament dominates the people. Um, and that would be another aspect of this hierarchy. But there's the physical, the, the, the kind of domination that's grounded in physical structures. And there's the kind of domination that's grounded in social relationships. Okay, so this is, and, and, uh, and I am 99% certain that, that Leibniz would agree with that, uh, that, that interpretation of what he's saying. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but the, you know, I want to emphasize that because I am giving it a Marxist sort of twist here. Okay, so, uh, but I think that Leibniz would go along with that. And, um, and, and so there's this whole hierarchy of do domination, which is expressed in the physical structure of the universe and in the social relationships of human beings. And at the very top of the hierarchy, so you might even have us, he, he might even say, and I think he would say that, that I'm not dominated directly by God, but I'm dominated by, you know, he might even say that, that the, and, and this is kind of a Hegelian, this is, this is where Hegel, this is where a lot of later things come from, is from Leibniz. Leibniz is the, is more than anybody else in the story, Leibniz is the origin of German ideology. And Hegel, which we'll get to at the end of the story, is the final representation of German ideology. Um, Leibniz might even say, and Hegel does say this, that my soul is dominated by the soul of the nation of the United States. And then, you know, you might sort out other sort of levels of hierarchy within that, like, you know, you're going to have, and, and we kind of, we kind of formalize this in representational Democracy, so like the the member uh, of my con congressional district uh, dominates my soul, and then the House of Representatives is is dominated, uh, you know, probably by the presidency. We'd have to say at this point, and then the president is kind of at the top uh, of the hierarchy. Uh, of course, that isn't the way it was supposed to be designed. You know, if you remember from your your civics. Um, education, but in reality, we have a very strong presidency, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so there's just these, these social forms of domination, but they're not grounded in physics. Uh, so those could always be modified, but in fact, they do operate okay uh, in such and such a way that we could describe. And so there's all this hierarchy of an infinite number of souls going all the way down to microscopic, you know, subatomic particles that have souls in them. And then at the very, at the very top of, of the pyramidal hierarchy is God. And God is the soul of the universe. So God does have a physical representation. It's the universe. Um, and, and so uh, God is the soul of the universe and he is the, the formal cause of the universe, but in substance, God is the universe, just like in the way that Spinoza was saying. And, and, and Leibniz was very much aware of Spinoza and was uh, agreed in general with Spinoza, but he wanted to still retain his own interpretation that he thought was a little better. Okay, so, and, and, um, and so, uh, and, and, and Leibniz's version is a little better in that it's much more attractive to philosophers. Okay, and, and it becomes dominant within Germany. 
So it's especially uh, better from a German, uh, a Germano-centric uh, viewpoint. <clears throat> So, uh, all right, so mm, there's two more points that I, I want to cover here. And, I, and then I also want to bring in the analogy of the matrix to make this all work. So I'm thinking uh, that's what I'm thinking right now. Um, now, what, he, what Leibniz wants to say is that each soul, and, and, and he calls these souls monads, okay? So this is the monadology. Um, and a monad now, I should say, and, and remember that Leibniz is a mathematician and Descartes is a mathematician and so they, you know, at certain points, they introduce mathematical concepts um, into the philosophical discussion and use mathematical terminology differently than it's normally used in, in, in mathematics. But a monad now is a point. In geometric terms, a monad is a point. And if you think about when you're constructing geometric figures, um, you may have heard that a point uh, doesn't have any length or width or depth, right? A point has no dimension, just like a geometric line. Okay, you draw a line on, on the paper, but that's not the real line. The real line that you're trying to conceive of is a line that has only length and no width. It's perfectly thin, so, so, so thin that it doesn't even have any width. So we can only conceive of these things in the mind. And, and, and Leibniz is inviting us to think about uh, his monadology as something that can really only conceive, be conceived of in the mind. The physical universe is a representation of this as an aspect of it, but underlying that aspect, or maybe even side by side with it, is this non-material aspect, which when you're thinking structurally has to be thought with the, the mind of geometry, of the mind of the mathematician. Um, so a monad is a single point and it doesn't have any, you know, a, a point could never exist in the real physical universe because there wouldn't be any way of detecting it because it, it doesn't exist. Uh, it doesn't have any, any size in any dimension. It's just a location, it's just a location. Um, and the monads now are indivisible. So the monad or soul of the mitochondria inside of a cell. So if you take one of those mitochondria and, and you say, okay, this has a soul, that soul is indivisible, but the mitochondria itself is divisible. And then there'll be souls inside of it. But each soul is indivisible. It's a monad because it doesn't have any extension. Uh, but there's this spiritual entelechy sort of force by which it controls the motions of the mitochondria. Okay. So the atoms in Leibniz's theory are not physical atoms that can't be divided, but spiritual atoms that cannot be divided. And even God in this conception would be a monad. And God is the soul of the universe, but God is a single point. Uh, God in his formal aspect is, you know, perfectly at rest and uh, indivis indivisible, 
perfect and whole, uh, but what makes God different from other monads is that God has this dominating IntelliKey over all the infinite number of IntelliKeys in the universe. And what we see is the physical universe is a manifestation or an aspect of this formal IntelliKey operation that is in this hierarchical structure. Now within this higher, I say dominance, um, but it's not the kind of forced dominance that that might suggest. It's a formal dominance in a kind of mathematical way that it in fact dominates, but it's not forcing, uh, God does not force the monads to behave in the way that they behave. Each monad is perfectly and absolutely free to do whatever it wants. Okay, so this is very interesting. Leibniz says that each monad is free to do whatever it wants. So the cannonball could move in any way and be totally undescribable. You know, the world could be totally chaotic and, and goofy uh, if the monad of a cannonball or of all cannonballs and all physical objects, all physical objects could just get up and walk around the room if they wanted to. So like your computer could get up and, and walk around the room if it wanted to. It could move in any way that it wants. Uh, or, or, you know, a computer has a lot of subcomponents that are only me mechanically connected. So Leibniz would say, okay, maybe your computer can't because it's, it's just kind of stuck together, but they're, the individual component parts are kind of forced against each other. But, uh, but, uh, uh, your but a cannonball if it really wanted to you know uh if all the all the the monads within the cannonball really wanted to they could make a cannonball do loop de loops shot out of a cannon and, and do loop de loops and things things that would be totally contrary to physics. Uh, and your dog, you know, could walk around on its hind legs if it really wanted to. And, and some dogs, you can train them to do that. Do they really want to do it? I don't know. But, but uh, you know, uh, there's all sorts of strange things that could happen in the universe if the souls involved wanted to behave differently. But in fact, they don't behave. They all behave in a very regular way. And we can rationally describe the universe because all the souls underlying physical reality conform to a rational sort of regulation of the universe. But God's not forcing them to do it. And he's not like the, and God is not like the occasionalists that, that we discussed before, where God intervenes in every single, inter God's not like, God just, it, it, God's at rest, right? And God's not, he's not worried about it. He's not running around fixing things. Um, the reason why all the monads conform to a rational universe is because in the beginning, God chose every single monad. And the monads that he chose are the monads that create the, create the rational structure of the universe. That's why he chose the monads that he could, because there's a, a, another infinity of monads that weren't chosen. There's, there, there are an infinite number of possible worlds. Uh, so, you know, you may have engaged in some discussions of possible worlds. 
possible worlds comes directly out of Leibniz. That's, he's credited with, with at least making that idea popular. Oh, that scared me. Um, so there are an infinite number of possible worlds, but the world we live in is a rational orderly world because God chose the monads that would behave in the way that they chose to behave, uh, but he, he collected together the monads that would behave rationally together. The world could be very differently, different. It's just that God chose this one so that all the souls, everyone's inclination, and this is down to the atomic level, everyone, including souls of subatomic particles, everyone uh, wants to do and behave in a way that can be rationally explained by like Cartesian physics, uh, but not quite. So they're absolutely free. Um, and they're absolutely subjected in this formal way of dominance that I was describing earlier, simply because God chose the ones, chose the monads that would behave in a system of dominance of their own free choice. Okay, so this explains, you know, this is, if you buy this picture, it's very explanatory. Um, and, and that's the, the attraction. It explains a lot of things. It explains social domination. It explains physics. Uh, there's just a lot of explanation, uh, explanatory value that you get out of this from a philosophical perspective. Um, okay. So I think I'll cut this off here and then I'll explain how this fits with the matrix uh, next off. <laughs>